Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our BGEN, host of the ongoing 15th Conference of the Parties to the United uh, Nations uh, Convention to Combat Desertification, the UNCCD. My name is David Akana, host of this fifth on the record webinar brought to you by the F Journalism Network, the Robert Bosch Stifton, in collaboration with UNCCD. A week ago, roughly a thousand delegates gathered here in the Ivorian capital Abidjan to advance discussions and find solutions to a critical global issue, that of land. During the first two days of the meeting, organizers assembled several high profile speakers, ranging from the president of Cote d'Ivoire and several other presidents of the region to leaders of international organizations, private sector, civil society organizations, businesses, and youths to highlight the need for the restoration of land for economic growth and the strengthening of the livelihoods of people dependent on them. During the first week, organizers put together several interactive dialogue and roundtable discussions, bringing together key global, regional, and national actors in the UNCCD ecosystem. Several thematic discussions were also held to further explore the critical issues linked to land. These include the third UNCCD Youth Forum, which ran from May 8 to May 9, featuring UNCCD land heroes from Africa, Asia, and Latin America, as well as the Caribbean. It also had youth champions from 11 countries that took part, or, or who are part, rather, of the Great Green World Initiative. There was also the Rio Convention, which brought together the climate, biodiversity, and land degradation a meeting of UNCCD, UNFCCC, and the CBD, which is the Convention uh, on Biological Diversity. The launch of the Abidjan Legacy Program was also, also took place, which primarily uh, aims at boosting long-term environmental sustainability across major value chains in Cote d'Ivoire. There was also the Green Business Forum, which went on from the 10th to the 11th of May, and it featured key Malian musicians and several UNCCD land ambassadors. And of course, there was the gender caucus, which featured the president or the uh, first lady rather of uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Dominique Ouattara. For today's briefing, we determined that it might be important for us to dig deep slightly or focus a little bit more on the gender dimension of land degradation. That's because it's such a central issue to the economic growth and well-being of the people, particularly in developing regions of the world. You may say in the developing South, so in Africa, in Asia, in uh, Latin America. And to us, it seemed like there was nobody better positioned to speak about this issue other than Ms. Loreno Angula, who is an international consultant, but also worked in government at several levels, both as a technician and as a politician, in the sense that she was the vice minister uh, for foreign relations in our country, our native country, Costa Rica. Thank you so much for Thank coming, you, David. Allow us to just introduce you a little bit further to our participants. Lorena is a global leader who is very passionate about human rights issues, uh, issues about inclusion and sustainable de development, rather, with over three decades providing strategic contributions to national and international policies, leading inclusive collaboration with government counterparts, UN agencies, international organizations, and civil society towards advancing inclusive and equitable sustainable development. Very important, inclusive and equitable sustainable development. And when we talk about that today, we are mostly referring to youth and women who do not often participate in all these processes. So thank you for coming to talk about this. Last point about her, Lorena has uh, field, uh, rather, uh, field experience rather, in more than 50 countries. Isn't that extraordinary? That's in Latin America, Caribbean, Eastern Europe, Africa, as well as in Asia. Ms. Aguila also served as Vice Minister, as I said, a of Foreign uh, Affairs in her native country. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, David, for this invitation. Thank you very much for allowing us to share uh, what the women and girls around the world are having to face because of uh, land degradation and climate change. Excellent. Great. So we would allow you 10 minutes about that, under 10 minutes as well, if you want to, mm -hmm. to give an introductory part of your introductory work. And then the journalists and the participants who are all joined us this morning would be able to ask you questions directly. So over Perfect. to you. And please allow her to put on her mask because we are still in COVID time and we're very sensitive We're COVID about time that. and I'm an old lady, so maybe it's all about it, the reason as well. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you very much. As I said, I mean, gender disparities uh, remain the most perversive of all inequalities. And they hinder the best development efforts uh, around the world. And unlike COVID, 
as a coronavirus, there is nor there will be a vaccine against gender inequality. So the time for action has never been more imperative. We cannot continue abusing and exploiting the earth, and it is time we realize the same is true for women. So in this talk, we launched a first of its kind study on the differentiated impact of land degradation and drought on women and men around the world. Right. <coughs> I'm sorry, and this study shed lights on this impact from six structural knots of gender inequality. The social economic inequality and the persistence of poverty, how we have the unequal control of access and control of natural resources. And this is not only women right. in general, because we women have very specific situations, but also for indigenous people, for indigenous women, right. for youth, is this intersectionality that is also important. We have limited or lack of access to markets and capital and training. Uh, the patriarchal and the discriminatory and violent right. cultural patterns. The sexual division of labor, we're going to talk about care work. Now we have just come out of what's called the Commission on the Status of Women. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of discussions about the linkages, about this reproductive work, but we can talk a little bit more about that. Right. And of course, the concentration of power. Now, why are these structural knots important, David? because they are socially constructed drivers of risk. So that means that you can disarticulate them. I mean, it's not a given fact that you're born with this. I mean, right. These are socially constructed. And, and therefore the efforts to ensure more gender responsive outcomes need to begin by tackling the sources and the origin. So when people said, I'm going to be gender responsive or I'm going to work with a gender perspective, but you really are looking at the barriers that these structural knots cause on differentiated people at the community level. So, for example, uh, related to land and to land degradation, we went in depth and analyzed the differentiated access and control to land. So, for example, less than 20% of all landholders globally are women. And when we are, the land tends to be smaller on a, and of lower quality than those. Uh, Could you just take that over 20% of? 20% of the world land owners are women. Okay. That's 80% are men. 80% are men. Or it can be enterprises or it can okay. be other type of forms. But exactly. yes, only 20% right. are women. Only 44 countries accord women the same inheritance rights. Only 44. Well, 29 countries do not grant female survival spouses and, and daughters the same right. This inheritance of the surviving spouse still occurs in 96 countries in the world. And women's rights to inherit their husband property are denied in 102 countries. David, how many countries do we have in the world? It's more than half of the country of the world. Right denies women the right to inherit the land if the husband dies. So she's kicked out of her property, sometimes with kids and left with nothing to survive. And 102 countries do not criminalize that. So this is the context in which we're talking about. And we might ask ourselves why this is important. Well, if you are not the owner, you cannot decide. So how are you going to decide uh, what type of activities you're going to conduct in your land if it is not yours? And tenure is linked to making decisions to avoid land degradation. Right. That is um, important. Right. And insecure tenure rights, it doesn't matter if they're women or men, are frequently cited as contributing to land and forest segregation. Right. If you don't own, you don't want to claim it. You don't have the, the access to do uh, a, a lot of things. You cannot use your land as collateral. You cannot go to the bank to ask for credit. Uh, on I'm sorry about the interruption. Things. I think, uh, yeah, sorry. Just... Oh, so we just continue, but yeah. I don't know who is helping uh, us. Michael? 
Yeah. Sorry about the interruption, guys. Uh, participants, we, we have uh, apologized about. Uh, okay. Yeah. So consequently, okay. David. Sorry about that. No, yeah. don't worry. I yeah. mean, this is this is part of being alive, and absolutely. this is part of being on a pop absolutely, absolutely. and a live space. We're all I here. Know, right? <laughs> so I mean, it just it, it's yeah. part of what we usually right. do. Right. Okay. Let's. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, let's keep I mean, it up. Yeah. Consequently. Mm -hmm. There is no gender equality without women's rights yes. to land. I mean, this is SDG number five, Sustainable Development Goal that talks about achieving gender equality. But there's no gender equality without women's rights to land. Right. And addressing women's land rights is imperative to any related to land degradation. In Mali, we did a very interesting, not under the UNCCD study, but when I was working on that, right. and they were working on land restoration projects. And we over layered where were the women headed households. 60% right. today were in the hands of the women. So how would any initiative working with land restoration was gonna work if you left on the side that 60% that lives in those degraded right, areas. Right. So that is important. Now also um, land degradation, that is one of the topics that we have, has a differentiated impact on the health of people. Right. So for example, when there is less food to eat, um, it happens in Africa, in many countries in Africa, it happens in Latin America. There is a cultural, socially constructed way of distributing food within the household. Right. Who gets served here first? The bigger pieces. The men. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Right. The women in Latin America, they say, I am the last one to eat. Mm. So if you have a chicken, you usually give the biggest part to the men, right. and then to the male child, right. and then to the girls. And then women end up eating the neck of the chicken and the fingers, not, I mean, like, like the legs, but the part that has the nails and everything. Uh, socially constructed distribution of food. The moment that the land is segregated, the, the moment that the soil cannot produce more, the moment that you face drought, the moment that you face the lack of food, she is the one that takes the first round of decreased food. Right. So a lot of study con conducted by the World Health Organization has identified that within the same household, that is suffering the same effects. Some members are the family under undernourished. 50% of women in all countries in the world have a right. So they are facing land degradation. They're facing climate change. Right. They're facing already from a very vulnerable position. Absolutely. When they are. So, um, this is where we are right now. And, the, and this is study what it wants to tell the world is, this is the data. These are not anecdotes. Sometimes when we work on gender things, people tell you, oh, oh yeah, that's an anecdote. No, this is data in which shows how we're facing that thing and that security around the world. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Um, well, first of all, thank you again, Ms. Lorena, for this, uh, you know, uh, bringing out this key, um, you know, uh, I'd say data about, you know, the differentiated impact of, you know, um, land degradation on women and youth and the very specific data that you brought out, which I think it's very critical in the sense that it highlights, you know, the sort of why we are where we are at this point and what needs to be done, the sort of action that needs to be done for us to be able to absolutely put ourselves uh, in the uh, right direction or in the right development trajectory. Um, if you're just joining us, uh, our briefer today is Ms. Lorena Aguila. She is uh, an international consultant working for UNCCD, and she was just speaking to this new report that is out there. Uh, would you just want to speak a little bit to where can we get the report? The journalists would need it. This data that you just threw out is something that will be of interest to them. So how quickly can we uh, say we can get that? <laughs> well, we launched it here, David, so okay. it's already available uh, right. online. 
uh, what is on, uh, available online is a summary for decision making decision makers because the right. documents is more than 250 pages right and nobody's gonna read it except right. some some of us that are a little bit crazy those type of right. information right but yes it's available online both in english um, in english french and uh, spanish right so you just ask for the uncc people for the link right Excellent, great. And uh, we can tell that uh, we are trying to make sure that we can send this out to uh, the reporters so that they can have it. Now, just as a quick reminder, if you do want to pose a question, please feel free to use uh, not only the chat function, but I think you're not familiar with this process. Use the Q&A function uh, and then just go ahead and ask any questions that you may have. There's one here, which is in your opinion, have women been sufficiently represented in the UN city proceedings? Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's an anonymous yes. attendee, but right. thank you very much for that question. It is very important because this study also created five new data sets okay. uh, related to uh, UNCCD. And one of them is that we looked at women and man participation during COVID. Right. 79% were men. 79? From the previous COP, right. and only 21% were women. That's in 2019. That's yes. in uh, so, India. Correct. 21% so, uh, women, 79% men. men. So some work needs to be done. I hope that when you analyze that of 2022, the data is going to be different. Well, let's see. Let's hope. I don't know. Right. But I mean, you can only hope, especially because the party has given themselves the mandate right. to have parity at this convention. Right, right. So yes. Um, that is something to be seen. Let's see how it works. Uh, parties didn't know about this data until we came here. Oh, okay. So hopefully uh, they will take, um, and, and David, it was for all the regions. Okay. There was no region. I mean, sometimes you said, oh, yeah, so it's going to have, or no, all the regions were basically at the same level. Imbalance representation. So, totally incomplete. Right, right. There is Sylvia from Cameroon who is asking, is it possible uh, to involve more women in the land uh, consultation committee uh, so that they make informed decisions about the protection of biodiversity and ecosystem and what of uh, desertification, uh, which is a concern. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, women need to be brought at all the levels. Right. David, not only at the high international decision-making processes, but you really need to work at all the different levels. Right. And you have to be innovative in right. the way you do it. Because as we said, these are culturally social constructed traditions. Right. Um, and you need to work. So for example, in your country, like yeah. in Cameroon, right. we work with the wives and the mothers of the chiefs. Right. So the mothers and the wives will convince the chiefs right. that women should have access right. and control over that. Right. So, yes. Right. Quick, quick point here, because what's the overall goal, if you just want to speak a little bit to that again, what's the overall goal of this report? Is it to inform better policy making? And if that is the case, to what extent or what are you doing to ensure that it actually makes make it into policy making? So that, that is very important, David. This study was commissioned um, to the secretary by the parties. Okay. So there is already a very good starting point. This is not something that came from uh, outside. Right. I mean, it was requested. And the study has a series of recommendations that you can take as party of the convention, that you can take as a government official, that you can take as media. Um, so it, it really highlights what are the type of recommendations and actions that you need to do. Right? Yeah, so, we can speak a little bit about the recommendations in a few minutes. What we, what we notice is based on what you found, it is not based on what you're finding. There is just so much that needs to be done, right? Based on the data that you just put out there. And the point here would be, could you speak a little bit in brief, I mean, briefly about some of the recommendations that you came out with in, in, the, uh, in the report? As you said, um, sometimes at the national level, because implementation is gonna happen at the national level. Right. I mean, I think we have enough mandates at the international level and among conventions, right. talking about uh, the need to ensure uh, land rights to win. Absolutely. The problem is how do you implement it? And sometimes you need to start by the policies at the national level. Okay. Now, 
However, some countries have good national uh, policies. Now, when it goes down to the towns and to the villages and to the provinces, we start getting a lot of these constitutionary law practices, which will avoid that to happen. So a lot of the work needs to happen there. As okay. an example, I tell you in Cameroon, sometimes women and men do not know they have rights. Absolutely. And that there is a law that they can tell you to do that. Right. So uh, that needs to happen. A lot more of efforts to really tackle those knots of inequality. Right. But David, they have to be innovative because sometimes you cannot enforce law by just giving people, you need to provide a carrot. Absolutely. Or you need to provide a different way of doing things. So I'll give an example of Mexico. And I think that a lot of people can live with the macho culture right. that we live in Latin America. All right. So a lot of these men are migrating and leaving the wives or partners behind with no land rights. So these people are, I mean, you're left, they're, how do you say, hand tied right. in, in that sense. Right. So when we start talking to the man about transferring, the they said, there's no way. My man which is related to how much land I hold. Right. Okay. So we said, okay, will you agree to give it on a concession, a long term uh, concession to the partner or wife? Oh, yes, I have no problem. So we avoid that cultural macho misconception that I, if I'm landless, I'm less, to, okay, this is another legal form right. that we can do that. Right. In other countries, what we have been doing is saying, convincing uh, the government officials, if the couple put the lines, the land and title of both, right. you don't pay taxes for X amount of years. Right. So to make it attractive. So this is about also looking at new innovative ways mm -hmm. of, of doing it. Right, excellent. Would you speak a little bit to some of the context specific issues of this report? Uh, when I say context specific, I'm talking maybe with respect to uh, sub saharan Africa. Yes. Are there any specific issues that you know you might want to share with the, the reporters who are participating this morning that you could highlight uh, from, from this report? Yeah, definitely. Um, as land tenure is context specific, right. and it's very uh, related uh, and very particular, Yes, let me let me pull up some of the data. Uh, the, I think it's uh, important. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's gonna take me some minutes to open that. That's okay. Maybe just to indicate that uh, the Q and A function is still right there. We are receiving quite some questions here, and uh, if you do have any, please don't hesitate to uh, send us uh, your questions. Call. Uh, from Nigeria, we're going to take your question in a few minutes. Uh, we may not take all the questions that come in. That's also because of the uh, time that we have uh, for this briefing. Uh, but let's speak to this uh, context-specific data uh, that you wanted to raise, and then we'll get Paul's question. So, David, the, the report looks, as I said, to very specific data breakdown. This this global data, right. you can break it down because it's very difficult. For, for example, for, for Sub-Saharan Africa, access to land and control over property remains one of the biggest challenges by right, right. all countries right. in sub-Saharan Africa have some form of discrimination, notably under customary law, which prevents women from enjoying secure access to land. Okay. Gender neutral clauses in civil codes and constitution guaranteeing all citizens equal rights are undermined by discriminatory customary law practices. Right. And five countries retain discriminatory laws in another 38 practice discrimination. That is sub-Saharan Africa. Excellent, great. And uh, we can tell you, uh, we are gonna send this over to you because we should know about this. The public should know about this, that yes. there are three countries that have discriminatory policies uh, and that it's important for us to report them. It's important for us to highlight this issue so that everyone knows exactly what's going on. Let's go over to Nigeria and get Paul's question. Paul has a question and precisely he wants to know, Apart from releasing this report, is there any mechanism for countries to implement the recommendation? That's Paul from the Nigerian Tribune, one of the oldest newspapers in Nigeria. Ah, thank you, Paul. Thank you for your question. Very important. Because why do we want to study if we're not going to change the lives of the women and the men on the ground? We did this study so that people can create 
conscious, but also to do something. So yes, first of all, I mean, there's going to be a declaration on land tenure and gender issues coming out of this. But now, for example, the ministries of women affairs or the mechanism of women affairs needs to also embrace these topics. The ministries of environment need to embrace these topics. And there are hundreds of NGOs and civil societies organizations right. Right. trying to work on this issue. But it's not easy. It's and businesses also have a responsibility. Oh, private sector. Right. And now that we're talking about a green transition, um, a just and equitable green transition right. again. How is it going to be just? And how is it going to be equitable if you don't own the land where you're going to have? This is, you know, looked at it from the lens that you have in this report, you'd have to say that land tenure issues are probably more critical, well, very, very critical as opposed to, and I think that's some of the messages that have emerged out of this conference, which is that land tenure issues or land issues overall have a bearing on almost every other component of society and community and economic development. I mean, it's the base, it's the foundation. As right. I said, I, I mean, I use this analogy, it's for, it's for our beach stand, but it's for our topsoil, it's for our forest happens. That is the foundation. And there's no way we can address environmental degradation and climate change without the source for our I'm going to get you to reflect a little bit personally, Ms. Loreno, because you've been in development for over 30 years and you've seen this a lot of times. So there's always, you know, the need for data, the need for evidence. You spend a lot of time, incredible amount of time with trying to use the best methodologies possible to come out with the best reporting possible. And that cycle keeps going on and on. It is not, it doesn't fit into policy as you'd like. And that cycle just keeps going. What in your view, this is personal, it might just be your personal reflection. Are you optimistic that, you know, if taken up, there is a likelihood that we begin to move in the direction that we want to move into? I have a lot of hope on you, David, and in the new generations. Yes, I have seen change, but not change at the speed that we need. Um, when I was going, I mean, talking about environment, the, they gave you all these crazy names because but this new generation have a green mind, have a green heart. And I really hope that we have enough time to see them come to the decision making project. And I can be like when we started this interview, we said, Yes, you elected the youngest president in Costa Rica in my country. He was a game changer. Right. He embraces human rights and environment. I mean, for example, in my role, he said, I want a diplomacy that is based on environment and human rights. Never to be heard 20 years ago. There is hope. David. Excellent. Excellent. There is hope. Matthew. And I share that hope. A with you. lot, a lot. And, and I hope we can all we can hold the fort as long as we can for these new generations that are not around. Excellent. With that word of hope, we would like to begin to draw to the end of this uh, uh, quick briefing this morning. Shall I just say here yeah, that the COP continues. We are getting into the second week and we are actually entering into the negotiations proper uh, for the rest remainder of the, the week. There might also be other uh, um, speech, I mean, meetings of the, U, uh, the, the overall UNCCD and it is expected to end on Friday. But obviously that's also going to be part of the briefing that we bring to you between now and Friday. We want to say thank you so much. If you do have any final word, we want to hear from you before we close this. No, thank you very much. And just the last thing, remember that human rights are human rights. Excellent, great. Thank you so <laughs> thank much. You we deeply good. appreciate that, Ms. Loreno. With that, women's rights are human rights. So with that, we we'll come to the end of this briefing this morning, mostly focused on gender issues. We hope to be with you again tomorrow rather than 10 a.m. GMT. Abidjan time, we shall be getting back to 9 a.m. GMT time uh, for us to bring you the latest information going on here at the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification in Abidjan. From Abidjan, I'm David Akana. Once again, thank you very much and bye-bye for now.